Hello, everyone. It's uh, Larry Kotlikoff back with uh, Economics Matters. Uh, and uh, the, this is the podcast. Uh, we have Economics Matters, the newsletter, Economics Matters, the financial Riddler quiz, but also Economics Matters, the podcast. And today we have Ron Soares, S-U-R-Z, who's president of Target Date Solutions. He's developer of the patent and safe landing glide path. And uh, his uh, and this st- so area so so soteria 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 personalized target date accounts and age sage do it yourself investing. He's also co-host of the Baby Boomer Investing Show. I've actually appeared on on. Uh, uh, you were our guest. Yeah, Ron's yeah. podcast. Thanks yeah. so much for having me. Sure. Ron's passion is helping his favor, his fellow baby boomers at this critical time of our lives uh, when we're relying on our, sorry about the background noise, it's going to stop in a second, when we're relying on our lifetime savings to support a retirement with dignity. So Ron uh, wrote a book called uh, Baby Boomer Investing in the Perilous 2020s, uh, and he provides, which I imagine is on Amazon and other places provides a financial education curriculum uh, as well. So Ron, great to have you, great to be back with you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I wanted to start out by asking you to tell folks about, this is a brief bio, but I wanted you to to tell folks, especially our younger um, uh, audience about your career, where, you know, starting with your career as a child, where were you born, (laughs) did you grow up, Uh, how did, where did you go to, how did you get, you know, what, what was your, you know, education? What did you do? How did you get to the point of being involved in target date uh, fund advice? Sure. So I was uh, brought up in Chicago, uh, went to uh, the University of Illinois for my first master's in mathematics, applied math, uh, and then second master's at the University of Chicago uh, in uh, business. So two, two master's degrees. My first job was with Northrop after I got my first master's in, in math. And I, I learned a lesson there as an engineer. I was hired for a particular project that was government uh, sponsored. Mm-hmm. And my boss came in when we finished the project and he said, so great, we're done now with this one. You need to wander the halls and find another funded project. <laughs> yeah. So I was, essentially, I was essentially fired. And they had to go begging for, for my next uh, assignment, which was you know, mind-blowing. Yeah. So I went back to school. Uh, um, I, I Actually, first, but next thing, I went to work for it. And, and the day was the largest pension fund consultant in the country. It doesn't exist anymore. It's called A.G. Becker. Sure. Be- Becker's, Becker's share of the pension consulting business was bigger than all the competitors combined. Merrill, Kell, and Russell, just add them all together, and Becker was bigger than that. And I was at my desk for a week, and my boss came in and said, would you like a raise? I'm thinking, a raise in a week? This is pretty cool. I like that. And he said, what do I need to do? And he said, go to school. So they sent me to the University of Chicago, uh, free tuition. I just had to carry a B-plus average, which which I did. So now I've got those uh, degrees. And um, I left Becker in the late 90s to start my own firm with two partners. Uh, but most of my work uh, was basically investment policy work, asset allocation for defined benefit plans. Then I'll fast forward to 2006. I got calls from friends in 2006 who said, there's this thing that's happening and it's right up your alley. You ought to get on it. And it's called a target date fund. I had never heard of that. Um, but I, I learned about it and sat down and developed what what I thought should be what everybody was doing. I, I really didn't research what everybody was doing. I just uh, designed something that I thought would be right. And my design, I thought, would, would be what everybody would want. My design was don't lose people's money. Now, wouldn't you think that would be sort of fundamental? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and, and you know, the engineering is around to sort of do that. So the, the, the glide path I developed, basically the first research was 
what are the chances of losing money if you're you know, in a well-diversified portfolio for a reasonable period of time? Well, that period of time ends up being around 15 years. So you have may have different uh, answers, but I found other researchers that came to sort of the same conclusion that you know, if you'll hang in there for 15 years or, or more for a well-diversified portfolio, you're, you're probably, you're highly unlikely to lose your money. So I moved to defend at 15 years from the target date. And the arithmetic underneath where I, where I go to defend is I estimate the worst case loss from today to the target date. And my mission is if you don't put in another penny, that from now to the target date, whatever your account balance is, it, it will be no less than that. And ideally, I like to uh, adjust for inflation too, but that's not what I actually do. That creates a curvilinear glide path, which starts out very slowly to move into a protective asset. Uh, at the target date, it really should be all protection, but I'm not a target date fund anymore if I put it all in cash. So, um, but at the target date, I'm about 70% in safe assets. And by safe, I mean treasury bills and uh, uh, intermediate term tips. It okay. turned out, yeah. by the way, the, the, the other thing that I'm doing there is, is using two Nobel Prize winning theories. So when, one is, you know, Harry Markowitz is efficient frontier. So when I'm taking risk, I take it pretty well diversified. So I have real estate in there. I have commodities. I have you know, other diversifying assets. And then when I move to defend, instead of moving down the frontier, uh, basically into more safe assets, <clears throat> I mix the market portfolio with uh, cash, safe asset. Mm -hmm. So I move along the capital market line. Um, Ibsen calls that the separation theory, and, and they um, they don't use it. <laughs> it's an S. They're 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 uh, target date glide pass, but they don't use a separation theory. I'm not sure why, but that that's that's my story. When you say who who doesn't use the target the uh, Morningstar slash Ibbotson, I, I said Ibbotson, but you know they had, they have bought by Morningstar, and the Morningstar designs are really I think sort of to have their underpinnings, their beginnings with uh, Ibbotson Associates. Okay, so so let me get let me get this right, you. You have a um, target date fund that people can actually purchase from you uh, in your company? Sort of. So I was running a target date collective investment trust, and my design underperformed for 13 years near the target date. So it was shut down the end of uh, 2021. But in the meantime, I acquired a uh, union account, the Office of Professionals International Union. So I'm still running their target date fund. But for people who want to use my design, they, there is a choice. There are two, two, two choices. One is I have that do-it-yourself website. It's called Age Sage. And I think if you Google Age Sage Robo, I'll, I'll, I'll come to the top of the, the search list. And their individual investors can tell me a little bit about themselves. And I will, and one of the things they can do is they can tell me they, they like a certain fund family, Fidelity or Vanguard or whatever. And, and I will give them sort of an allocation that they should look at. I, I don't expect anybody to follow my sort of guidance exactly, mm -hmm. but I give them sort of an, an idea about, you know, what the appropriate kind of asset allocation might be for them. So, and you're charging for this, or what's that? Yeah, it's just... Um, if I gave it away, nobody would respect it. So. Okay. What does it cost for people? Fifty dollars for an answer. Okay. So, so if you want many answers, you can buy a package. You might want to. If you're an advisor, you might want to set it up for your for your clients. And, and um, so, so you actually individually email people back. You... No, this is all interactive. It's online. It's online. You, get, online. you generate the report right online. You okay. can download um, sessions to Excel. So it's 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 all I don't touch it. It's just all sort of between so, you and the, uh, the the it's a robo. Okay, and then you said you had another product that you're marketing. yeah. So one of the we're bouncing around here a little bit, but this, this is good, Larry. I really like the questions. One of the shortcomings in target date funds is that they are one size fits all, and there have been several attempts to try to correct that. Um, 
the larger fund companies, including Fidelity, have said what we're advocating is that if you're in a target date fund, you should bounce out, get out of that target date fund at about 10 years to retirement and move into our managed account. And that makes some sense. Now, the managed accounts, uh, by the way, there's this, but the reason that the call is happening in 2006 was the Pension Protection Act of 2006 uh, uh, declared three what they call qualified default investment alternatives, They're frequently referred to as QDIAs. Target date funds have become the most popular. The second most popular is managed account. And the far distant third is a balanced account. So what Fidelity is saying is move out your target date fund, move into the managed account, and, and there you'll get specialized treatment. So you'll, you'll be taken care of, and we realize that's you know the sweet spot in your, in your savings lifetime. That would work if there were individual advisors involved. <clears throat> but what normally happens is they turn you over into a interaction with a computer, and defaulted people don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> they default because they, they're not sure what they want somebody to tell them what to do. And that just doesn't happen to that. So what's gone on recently over the last five years, basically, is some providers have come to market which, with what might be called a personalized target date account. I just came to market uh, this year with my version of that. And it's called Soteria. Now, coming back to, to the question, who can use my design? I designed Soteria to be used by investment advisors. So it's software for the record keeper to use to um, be able to trade to the glide path that the uh, plan sponsor and the participants have chosen. I, I'm abbreviating this a little bit. I can I'd love to get more into, into the details. But but two options. Do it yourself first. You can go to ASAGE. Investment consultants can uh, work with me. Uh, and their record keeper to use a personalized target date account, which I, I think is a far better solution than target date funds. Should I go into detail on that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right. So in a target date fund, you only get one glide path. Mm -hmm. And it's the same for everybody. And it's normally broken into 10-year grouping. So you get a 2010 fund, a 2020 fund, and so on. With a personalized account, you get to choose your risk. And the choices I know generically are low, middle, or high risk. But with Soteria, you can blend those. So you can say, I want to be, this is a big argument, 30% high risk and 70% middle risk. That's fine, whatever you want to do there. And you can choose your target date. Now, those two levels, those two levers give you control over your risk. The so target me, date, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Let me, yeah, let me just, being the economist, I got to push you a bit. Sure. Uh, when you when you refer to risk, are we talking about risk um, of a certain amount of money at the end of at some target date, or are we talking about risk of your living standard over your entire future? A little bit of both. Okay. So um, I didn't say this. So let me let me uh, say that the the industry is dominated. It's, it's an oligopoly, basically. Three and a half trillion dollars, 70% of it is managed by just three companies, Vanguard, T. Rowe, and Fidelity. Those three firms have sort of set the standard for, so back up, just one step. Target date funds are almost identical for young people. So they're fairly risky. Then when you get close to retirement, that standard has been set, and you, you, this should shock you if you're not familiar with at least 55% in equities at the target date, the day you're going to retire. And most of the balance of the assets at the target date are in long-term risky bonds. So I say they're about 85% risky at the target date. We've now, just, I just said... Yeah, we've just seen what long-term, even medium-term bonds, how risky they can be with, you know, this yes. with, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. They were holding a lot of 10-year treasuries and similar securities viewed as perfectly safe, interest rates go up and the discounted value of those securities goes down, the market Perfect. value goes down, the bank's assets go down relative to its liabilities. Yep. The difference is the owner's equity 
that goes negative, they go broke, there's a run on the bank. And we have over half of the FDIC insured banks who are, are on a mark to market basis because of investments like this, and probably also some commercial real estate properties, uh, you know, office buildings are uh, underwater at the moment in the sense that they're the market, the market, they're bankrupt. And so we have kind of an SNL situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where uh, we could have a, the SNL crisis played out over nine years, something like 1500 banks went under. Wow. Where we've had, I guess, the second, third, and fourth largest bank failures in US history occur in this crisis, but more could be coming because sure. all these things are underwater. Yeah. And if, unless their assets miraculously revalue, which would mean interest rates would come down quite quickly before the deposits leave. Uh, but there's 7 trillion out of about 17 trillion in deposits in these banks that are that are uninsured and people can take them out with a couple uh, you know, swipes of their fingers right. at the moment. So um, I, I agree hundred percent that long-term bonds are not particularly uh, safe. I, even short-term, even five-year or two-year, even one-year bond, if you're having uh, inflation that you thought was gonna be, let's say 5% turns into 10%, you're gonna lose 5% real. Yep. So it's very tough to, I mean, tips, yeah, so, yeah. tips, inflation index bonds are safe against inflation uh, changing on you. But the problem with that is that you get taxed on the insurance protection that they give you. And that can be a, quite big. I mean, if you went from, let's say, a situation of a zero, a zero uh, inflation, very low inflation, 1% to 10%, and you had a 30 year tip. You could be. Oh yeah, sure. Part of your return is going to be wiped out by taxes. Right. Okay. Got it. So, so no, that's this problem. Yeah. Things that are safe in this real in this world, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 a, a diversification. <clears throat> and you're you're going to tell us a little bit about this separate. The folks are not going to be familiar with separation theorem and Markowitz diversification. So expound a little bit on that because these these are. Uh, you know, this work that was done in the 50s, foundational finance. Right. Harry Markowitz got the Nobel Prize. Uh, Bill Sharp got the Nobel Prize. Mar uh, Tobin worked, I think, also on separation theory theorems. Uh, sure. All connected to the capital asset pricing model uh, that was popular at the time. Uh, but maybe you want to, you know, just uh, nerd us out a little bit for a couple minutes on that stuff. Sure. Well, I want to come back to your original face before you even go there. Not a single target date fund that I know of is using any of that theory. Really? And the, the glide paths are pretty much ad hoc. I've written stuff that I think they've designed them for profit. Surprised. Hmm. <laughs> but but coming back to uh, what, what my objective is. Tell me. My, my objective is to get people through what retirement researchers called the risk zone, the five to 10 years before and after retirement, mm -hmm. where if you're unfortunate to lose money in that time period, they call it sequence of return risk, can ruin the rest of your life. Now, we haven't had that risk for a long time. The last time we really saw it was 2008. In 2008, the, the 2010 funds for people retiring between 2005 and 2015, you ready? You probably know this, but the, I don't know if your listeners do. They lost more than 30%. Can you imagine saving for your lifetime? And then you've made plans to do whatever you're going to do. And then in a very short period of time, you've got 30% less in, in your portfolio. This is just because of, this is not sequence of return where people are taking out money uh, from these accounts. And then the next day the market does well and they've lost because they've taken out money. Uh, this is just not taking out money, not taking distributions. It's just the, the asset value. Yeah, the, the stock market took 30% away from you. Yeah. So uh, by the way, back in 2008, bonds actually did protect a little bit. 
So, but the, the portfolio still lost 30% back then. What you're saying is that the notion that target date funds are safe uh, and that they should be the fiduciary option or one of the three of kind of the default. If you don't choose what to invest in in your 401k, mm -hmm. your employer automatically can put you into a target date fund. Right. Probably designed by Fidelity or T. Rowe or Vanguard. You're saying that we've had instances where people have gotten terribly burned because maybe without even knowing what they were promised that the money was, they were, they were going to hit the target, that the money wasn't going to be 30% less. It was going to be, you know, some kind of average return that they could anticipate uh, getting for sure or for almost sure. Absolutely. And but uh, so you think that in, in effect that, we got a bit of a scam going on here with targeted funds. I, I do. You know, these are reputable firms. The Vanguard and Fidelity Real are, are great firms. By the way, in 2008, I was running a portfolio then, you know, the Collective Trust. My portfolio was down 5%. So huge difference. And so speaking, you, said, you said at the beginning, Ron, that, that you had to close down a fund that you were running because it underperformed the market for 13 years. From 2009 uh, through 2021. That's so. So tell me about when you say underperformed. Underperformed a little bit. Underperformed a lot. And why did that happen? And is this saying that your target date fund wasn't safe? I mean, what? I just wrote an article. Actually, the last paragraph in the article is <laughs> the danger of safety. I mean, you're kind of giving us a confession here. I want to make sure you're not over. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that the, the the article speaks to this, and I think well, most a lot of people who follow target date funds know this. BlackRock has been sued. The first like, um, and, and, and on many plans, not just a single plan, but many plans that use BlackRock's target date funds, they've been sued for underperformance, and they, these suits are getting lost. So the the law firm that's doing these suits is losing these cases, but and they should. But it sets a precedent of sorts. But the the fact is, BlackRock is is much riskier than my design, but uh, less risky than the industry. So they are roughly seventy five percent risky at the target date, and the industry is eighty five percent. So mm -hmm. we've got you know this this modern portfolio theory thing about you know you risk generally gets rewarded for long periods of time for the period two thousand nine to twenty twenty one. I was very safe. The industry was not. It got rewarded. I did not. But most fiduciaries don't get that. They just don't get it. You underperformed in the term in terms of return, but you overperformed in the term in terms of safety. And on a risk adjusted basis, I outperformed. Yes. But nobody looks at risk adjustment. Hmm? So my sharp ratio is higher than the industry. It's just well, I think that's very important. Maybe just explain to everybody what the sharp ratio is so that Everybody knows. Yeah, so it's basically uh, the return per unit of risk is basically the return you've earned divided by the standard deviation of, of those returns. But when you look at your sharp ratio, you're looking at uh, something connected with every, you know, an average over all the years, or is it accumulative uh, over a period of time? Yeah, I, I need to have 2008 in the mix to win win that race. <laughs> but, but I mean, how's the actual how you actually how do you actually calculate your sharp ratio? Okay, so I took the returns from 2008 through 2021. Yeah. On, on my so I start with the 2010 fund and then move to the 2020 fund. I think about midway just to have you know the the the, the current um, retirees in the mix. I do the same thing with the industry. By the way, a good industry uh, index is the uh, S and P target date index. It's basically a, a combination of of all the target date funds. Morningstar has something similar, but it's more normative than than you know, a, a combination of real funds. So when you take in the average return for the sharp ratios of the numerator, numerator mm -hmm. and yet the denominator, denominator of the ratio is the standard deviation. What are the data points that are going into the average and the standard deviation? Are these annual returns? For the standard deviation, I use quarterly. Um, but that doesn't really matter that much, I don't think. But and then it doesn't matter for the for the total return. It's it is what it is. Okay. So 
So now let's let me talk to you about um, you know from an economist perspective, you're kind of saying uh, let's think about somebody's not going to actually use the money. It's it's for their retirement. That's why it says retirement date fund. So it's like this money's off the table, and um, uh, uh, so we don't have to think about people's consumption dropping, you know, 10 years out because their target date fund has done really poorly because the market dropped 52%, let's say in the 2008, uh, 53% actually in 2008, 2009, uh, and that they're not going to adjust their spending. Now, an economist would say that regardless of whether it's called target date fund and it's in this, in this uh, a particular pot, this pot of money, that I, as a, uh, I may, my strategy might be, I'm gonna spend out of all my resources, all, I'm gonna adjust all the time. This is what economics would say. Every period, every year, I'm gonna be looking at exactly everything I've got at all the pots. Mm -hmm. And that pot, which was called safe or target date or designated for, uh, for taking money out in 20 years, if that's gone down, it doesn't matter. I'm going to look at everything uh, comprehensively and adjust down my spending. And adjusting your spending downward is risk to an economist. Mm -hmm. And and that's ultimately, you know, what the early when the early um, these early uh, papers the, uh, papers in uh, that won the Nobel prizes, they were one period holding period papers where you had your money initially, and then you, at the end of the period, you had your wealth, and that's when you consumed. So it was ultimately about risk of consumption. And now we have these intertemporal models of, of uh, portfolio allocation where people are going to be consuming every year, uh, and there's risk every year. And so what I'm getting at is whether uh, a concern with target date funds uh, that's been underemphasized is the focus on just retirement as opposed to what they could imply for risk along the path to retirement because you would be adjusting potentially your your spending every year and seeing that your retirement your, your, your target date fund has done your bucket okay strategy isn't working all that or may not be working that well at least it hasn't worked that well for, last year, I got to cut my spending. So I'm just wondering about the, the kind of overall concept of target date funds um, as opposed to a more holistic view of, of investing and investment risk. We have, I, I know you you know that uh, I have the software company. We have a right. yes. planner that does what's called full risk investing and also upside investing. And uh, the upside investing is actually closer to target date fund, fund because it says okay. don't spend out of anything risky, just buy tips and hope the inflation rate won't be too crazy and kill you on the taxes or right. try some other safe, secure, safe thing like maybe some real estate uh, townhouse that you can rent out pretty safely and get a uh, and not sell uh, and not face capital gains taxes. Uh, but um, Anyway, there you have, uh, you're building like a four to your living center based on your safe investments and the stuff that's risky, which could also include target date fund investments. You don't touch until you do hit retirement. And then once you touch that, you put it into safe assets, once you withdraw. And of course, how much you'll withdraw is risky, but it's all going to be upside risk because you've set a floor to your living center because you've gone along, said all that money's gone. I put some money there. I hope there's something in the future, but I'm not going to, I'm going to assume it's gone. I'm going to be super risk averse. That's my living standard floor of upside. Now, the other way the tool runs is, a, is full risk investing, which is I'm going to look at everything, no matter what, what bucket it's called. And uh, every year I will just up and down my spending uh, in light of how I've done. So I will have this trajectories of my living center will be up and down. Sure. And 
So I'm wondering, uh, we haven't done any systematic study of this, but I think I will, but whether target date fund investing, uh, if you are looking at everything all the time, would um, be uh, a, uh, you know, safer than just a, a mixed portfolio, a balanced portfolio. That's one of the questions I wanted to Yeah, Yeah, so, some people have written that you'd know, be better off 60-40. Um, okay. I, I think if you if you think the risk zone is for real, and I, I do, 60-40 in the risk zone is probably not the best for you. But when, one of the things I, I do want to say is the glide path, there are glide paths in retirement. And and the let me just say they're they're pretty static. Um, most of the target date funds are what I call two funds. I'm sorry, through funds. So they they don't actually level out until they're about ten years after retirement. They generally level out at about forty five percent in equities. My glide path is U shaped, and, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is early on when I when I patented my design, I got feedback from thoughtful consultants who said my clients can't live on thirty percent in equities <laughs> and thirty percent in yeah thirty percent in equities seventy percent in cash. It's just not enough payoff there. And I took that to heart, but you no, know, my reason for my design at that time was the data was saying most people took their money out when they retired. So no matter what I did, you no know, post retirement, it didn't matter because there was there was they're gonna they're gonna take their money, but that's changing. So there there there's there's more evidence that especially union funds are encouraging people to stay in the plan. So it does matter what the life path is like after after you retire. And when you say U shape, you're just saying high equities, low equities, back back to high equities. Yeah. Portfolio share. Yeah. So the absolute amount may be lower. Right. So. This actually corresponds to a paper that I wrote with a couple of economists uh, that show that as people get older, they should put a bigger share of their portfolio into equities for the following reason. Uh, you become more bond-like in old age. You get Social Security, which is a, in effect a bond. There you go. You, and you're working down your, your other assets, your fungible assets, you're spending them down. So you're naturally uh, automatically going more into bonds and less into stock in terms of your overall resources in old age. Yep, right. So you want to put a bigger share proportion of your risky assets that are dwindling risky assets, a bigger share of those all the time into equities. That's what we showed in this paper. And you you patented this idea that we wrote a theoretical paper about. Yeah. It, it, it dovetails with a couple of things. One, one is um, you've probably seen this paper, but Dr. Wade Fowle and Michael Kitsis uh, did research probably six years ago now on the optimal glide path in retirement. Now they they didn't do something as elegant as what you just said. They just did brute force simulations. Just I mean, the, the, reading the paper makes your hair hurt. But at the end of the day, the winner was to start retirement very safely. And then to uh, increase your risk to extend the life of the assets, essentially. But um, Michael um, Michael Kissies wrote a paper not too long after that and said, "You know, look, you guys, you're complaining about our research, but that's what you do. So most of you guys use buckets, and you tell your client to spend the bond bucket first in retirement, for the same reason you were saying, Larry, to give the equities a chance to run. When you do that." You know, you're increasing your equity exposure. Let me connect this to uh, one of the most important uh, results in, in finance. It was uh, two other Nobel Prize winners, Paul Samuelson and Bob Merton. Bob Merton huh? got the Nobel Prize, uh, to, well, together with Myron Scholes and Fisher Black, who would have gotten yeah. it had he not passed away. Sure. Uh, so these guys developed the option pricing theory, the right. of Fisher Black. Uh, but it was really Merton as well, Fisher Black Merton option pricing theory, which is used so much in, yeah. in Wall Street. But sure. in addition, Bob wrote, uh, you know, fundamental papers. Uh, he's got a book called Continuous Time Finance. And Paul Samuelson separately, even though like there are a few doors down from each other, they're both working on the same paper. I think it was like the late 60s. 
uh-huh. which was this question, which is, if you're, let's say, 20 years, 25 years old, let's say you're single to keep it simple, you have some safe and risky assets, uh, you're risk averse, you'd be very risk averse or not that risk averse, but uh, should you hold the same portfolio through time as you age? And what they both showed is that for the kind of standard form of preferences about risk of, about consumption, you, happiness from consumption, but being risk averse uh, about having your consumption drop, that that hurts you a lot more than having it go up a lot. Having it fall in half helps you, hurts you a lot more than having it double helps you. That's the notion of risk aversion. That's sure. the, well, curvature of the utility of the utility. Happiness is a function of you of consumption. Looks like a a curve um, with a declining slope. Mm-hmm. And they said that this for what's called the isoelastic class of preferences, which is just commonly used and has lots of nice features that they found each found the same remarkable result that your portfolio should stay exactly the same through time as you age. Now by portfolio, I mean the share of your, uh, it's, it's like if all your assets, all your future labor income, uh, all the resources you have, you have in your pocket right now, uh, should you through time, so you just had like wealth, wealth at day one, and you weren't going to earn any money, no social security to keep it very simple. Got it. Should you, through time, always be holding the same share of your assets? You're going to consume through time, and you'll be consuming more or less as the market does, as your portfolio does well or poorly. But should that those por- that portfolio at each point in time could be larger amount of money or smaller amount of money because you've done poorly, or should that share stay fixed that's in stock? And they said, yeah, they said uh, that, that this uh, model shows clearly you want to maintain that portfolio. It's very counterintuitive. Some For those people think that as you get older, you should go into bonds. And mm-hmm. But, uh, but not, that's not what economics says. It says you should hold the same basic portfolio. And if you're more risk averse, that share that's in stock that's constant, that constant share that's in stock should be smaller. And the constant share that's in safe assets, let's say bonds, should be higher. But that, but uh, anyway, staying safe, the same through time. But now, since you don't have all your money up front, uh, you are in effect uh, by working and getting a bond because that's not that correlated with the stock market, like your labor income, and then you have this other bond, Social Security. So, so this idea of whether you're a stock or a bond, it, it all goes back to Merton and Samuelson. Interesting. And I, 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 I thought that to, was Ibbotson's work, but I realize now they've... they've you know, it's Merton yeah. Samuelson, way before uh, Got it. young Ibbotson was uh, uh, out there and doing huh? his good stuff, but uh, with people like Steve Ross, the um, who was my college professor. So I know... Okay. Uh, but anyway, so the... Um, basic idea that people might have in their their mind, which is what economics says, is you always want to have like this constant share of risky to to safe and safe assets, but that some of the things that don't look like financial assets are actually financial assets like labor income, yep. like social security benefits. Sure. And so once we think about it holistically, then we can think about why it makes sense to uh, Actually, as we get older and we become more like a bond, we have more of this. You know, automatically, we're being pushed more into bonds. That's why we want might want to offset that to try and keep this constant Samuelson Merton ratio fixed. Mm-hmm. Got it. My lecture as a professor, I have to kind of yeah, sure, go off, go off got it, <laughs> and do my professorial thing. Right. So uh, one of the things you touched on, I just want to say it's in terms of your other assets, when you're designing this glide path, you don't know what the other assets are and then you can't come to know. And then it's actually it's sort of this, this approach for personalized accounts. Uh, one provider is trying to do that, but they're only using data on the record keeper system. So you don't know what the other assets are. You're, you're strictly relying on, you know, what you've been contributing, what your current account balance is, you know, the you, obvious things. 
You mean you don't know what you're being invested in? Is that what you're saying? I, I All I know is what's on the record keeper system. And you could have a defined benefit plan. You could have a you know, mansion you live in. <laughs> all, these, all these other assets that I don't know about and I never will. So all, all you can do for the target date fund thing is is assume, for sake of argument, that that's all there is. Oh, okay. You're saying that for anybody who's just trying to design a target date fund, they may not have information that's really relevant. You don't. You don't have that information. Yeah, that's so right. it's really that the household should say, okay, the target date fund is is helping me, but I have got to look holistically at everything, not just yeah. the target date. And that's what our software will allow you to do. Because exactly. Yeah. So incorporate all your assets, not just. And then there's also the fact that when you said you may not know what your other assets are, I was thinking immediately about labor income uncertainty. My no, that's company. that's sort of baked into the design, but I'm just saying something much simpler. Yeah, you're if you're saying, designing a target date fund, right. you, you 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 can't and never will know everything. Uh, yeah, any any other things that matter. That all you know is. I, I do want to say one other thing about this point that if you're more risk averse, more concerned about the downside than the upside, uh, the Merton Samuelson. Uh, uh, Prescription was a small share in equities forever, a mm -hmm. small share in risky assets through your entire life. Every, you know, comprehensively evaluated. But then if you're also facing late uh, labor income risk, so you've got this thing that's kind of like a bond, but it's a it's got it's a risky bond, but the, the risk is kind of uncorrelated with the stock market or mm -hmm. even the bond market, uh, then that acts like more risk aversion. And you should probably also cut down not just your share in risky assets while you're holding this risky labor income when you're getting that, but also you should be thinking twice about how much you're spending. So one of the key things that the, our software is focused on is that spending behavior is as important as investment behavior when it comes to limiting downside yeah. future. I, I agree. Yeah, you know, that's that's part of the I think the merit, the benefit of personalized. So the participant can choose the risk today. Right. But events happen, life changes. Right. So you, they can decide to do a different amount of risk whenever they want. Right. And you can control your risk by being more cautious about spending. And yeah, you uh, can do that, sure. And and also more cautious about your overall. You've got those, those right. You've got two levers to tweak. One is investments, the other is spending. Yeah. But the other thing to think about here in the context of target date funds and investing in retirement accounts like 401ks uh, is that you can't necessarily, there's this issue of cash flow constraints that you can't, you're locking away money for retirement that you can't necessarily get at. So it might be you know, that you see your target date to fund go, to go down and you might lower your spending, but um, you may need that spending to, to make mortgage payments. So you may not be able to. Sure. So, so the other aspect of our financial kind of lifetime uh, decision-making here or, or outcomes here is how much of our money are we locking into into this uh, segment of our life in the future that we can't get at. So in that sense, uh, uh, you know, we kind of have two separate problems, what to do before retirement and what to do after retirement. In that context, because we can't get at that money. So if we lock up a lot into a target date fund, then that's basically going to be it because we may not be able to save anything more and we won't be able to get at that money to, 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 to reduce it. Uh, so then we've got like, you know, this two part problem. And uh, that's, I think, also kind of an interesting. Yeah, it is. There's actually, actually most plans allow for loans. So in, in effect, you're sort of borrowing money from yourself. So you can actually take some of that money out. Yeah, um, but I, most I'm people who sure talk I, about that say, don't do that. Because yeah. you, you're going to need those savings. Don't don't spend it now. 
wait, so, wait until so, you need yeah. it. So part of chart, I guess what I'm kind of moving around to here is that part of this is self-discipline, this issue of behavioral finance, where people have noticed that we have, you know, like 75 or so million baby boomers coming into retirement. Yeah, right. And That's the right number. That wealth is about three years of median spending. True. Median household Americans. So, so right. you're 65, you're retired, you've got 35 potential years to live. And the probability that you and your spouse, that one of you will make it to 90 is very high, but you have right. to worry about both of you making it to, to 100, really, because mm -hmm. you could. And here you have three years of, of consumption that you've accumulated for. So you have to, um, so having mechanisms that help you discipline yourself. Uh, and that's what things, that's this whole movement in the design of 401k plans were automatic enrollment, automatic. At Yale University, for example, just reformed their plan. They limited the choices so that people couldn't do, I think, things that they viewed as too risky um, and get overwhelmed by the decisions and not be able to mm -hmm. come up to an answer. But they also said every year, uh, your contribution is going to, to the fund, to the 401k, is going to flip back to the maximum unless you uh, tell us affirmatively that you want to reduce your contribution. Right. So, so auto-escalation auto is a... Is auto a escalation. Yeah. And, sure. and um, target date funds are their default. Uh, uh -huh. So I guess my question to you is, you're running Yale University. Would you make target date for everything you know? Let's say it's not being designed by you, but it's being designed by Fidelity or Vanguard or uh, Tier of Price or somebody else. Uh, the, the industry, broadly speaking, would you make that the default investment? Or would you make tips the default investment? Really, be fiduciary? Let's say most responsible or most conservative, cautious. Would you make? A 50 50 bond or 60 40 uh, bond stock portfolio that the default. What would you do if you're running Yale's fund or Yale system? Well, since the alternatives I don't like, I think they're way too risky at the target date. I, I, I'd probably do what the industry was doing before the Pension Protection Act of 2006. Mm -hmm. The default before the act was cash. So you stop there. You really, so what, you're saying that fiduciary responsible thing is not really cash, but tips, I would say. Huh? You know, something like that, but something very, very safe. Right. That's what I would do. Now, I would know when I did that, that for younger people with a long horizon, that's probably not doing them a favor. But for people who have saved for a lifetime, I would feel more fiduciarily responsible by not putting that money at risk. So an employer, yeah, you're, what you're saying is the same. I don't know if you know Zvi Bodhi. He's yeah, a, sure. Yeah. Zvi is a, a close friend and he's been yeah, a colleague. Sure. Cash and friend. calls. What? Cash and calls. Yeah. So yeah, Zvi's idea would be uh, tips as your basic floor of your investment mm -hmm. and uh, buy options to yeah. have us some upside. And that's not much different from our upside investing that we have in maxify.com. Sure. Is uh, it's really sustaining, uh, you know, a stable a floor of your living standard and upside from the, these money in the, in the stock casino, but it's a fantastic casino, but if you're not taking it out, uh, until a later date, you're not subject to sequence of return risk, which again is I take the money out exactly at the wrong time and right. it's screwed. Um, so over that period that you're not taking out, so then you have a much higher chance that you're going to take out something positive, and then you, when you take it out, you put it to make it yeah, safe. I get it. Up. So that's all, um, all I say is from a fiduciary perspective, and this I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying when you start buying options. If for whatever reason those options go south on you, yeah. it's a very litigious society. 
So I, I really don't know as a practical matter if you could, if you do that, but, but maybe you could, I don't know. I don't, I'm not aware of anybody doing that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think options are expensive. And I don't think that, I think this other kind of having your own option, which is you buy, put some money. Oh yeah. If you do it on yourself, then you're on, you can do a lot of I things. Mean, sure. I mean, what I'm saying is that the upside investment is like an option, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. or, and the upside to your living standard is just like an income. You've got a tips income path and then the options come due and they're go either up or zero. Right. So it very much is replicating that type of um, thinking, but it's right. the living okay. side, not the income side. But so, so we've gone on for a bit. Um, tell me uh, some, some other, uh, anything else that you want to kind of lay out to the general audience here about investing. Sure. So when 2008 happened, there was a public outcry. And the first and only ever joint hearings of the SEC and DOL happened in June of 2009. And the, the, the reason for the hearings was to cause that to never happen again. Don't expose the fiduciary or retirees to that great risk. Nothing happened. Just um, put a place mark there. <clears throat> I spoke to some ERISA attorneys about that time. And there's two things going on there. At that time, there's only $200 billion in target date funds. So no, enough to make it worthwhile to, to file suit. But they said that they, just, they just weren't ready. They weren't prepared to, uh, to do lawsuits. Last year, the 2020 funds were down 15%. Still not enough pain. But the next time we got real pain, I, I expect the plaintiff's bar to do what they do. To say, there's there's a huge harm here. Why are you guys taking all this risk? And it's going to be something like the first response will be, well, everybody's doing it. But we've had successful lawsuits for excessive fees. Everybody was paying way too much. But those lawsuits have succeeded. So you're saying that Fidelity is going to get sued by everybody when their target date funds go down the well here's what here's what happened with BlackRock and I think this is what happened with, with excessive risk. Fidelity won't get sued. Fidelity's just providing product. You can choose not to buy that product. Mm -hmm. So the fiduciaries will get sued. And that's what's going on with these well, the, 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 I, I'm not in favor of the BlackRock lawsuits because we both know that <laughs> There's, there's an opportunity cost to being safe, and that's what BlackRock did. But when you're taking way too much risk and people are, their so lifestyles are, are being ruined. So in this case, BlackRock was was advising, let's say, an employer. Well, they, they, they're the money manager. So okay. these, these plans chose the BlackRock target date funds. The plans are getting sued. So that's and what would happen, I think, in excessive risk uh, lawsuits. Fidelity has a, has a target date funds too, no? Fidelity, again, Fidelity, Vanguard, and T. Rowe Price right. managed 70% so of why three and a half trillion get, dollars. Why wouldn't Fidelity get sued? They're just selling product. If you want to buy a risky product from them, that's on you. But wait, if they're managing an employer's 401k plan, which I guess they are, they are. No, they're managing the target date fund. I see. So they're not advising you take out the... I see. No, I mean, the, the glide path is what it is. Whereas BlackRock is, is doing what? How, how's BlackRock acting differently from Fidelity in this case? They're, they're a little bit safer at the target date. No, but what are they doing legally that's different? So that Nothing. Fidelity, you, but you said Fidelity can't be sued, but BlackRock could. BlackRock has not been sued. What but, I'm saying is in the BlackRock related lawsuits, the plans that chose BlackRock are being sued. Not BlackRock. The plans, so it's really the employer. Yes. Okay. So what you're saying is that we could have employers throughout the country. We have like 35 million employers out there, small business, small big businesses. Most are. The small ones won't get sued. The big ones will. Ones will, will <laughs> the big, big employers could be sued because they have, Yale University has defaulted people into whatever, uh, Vitality or TIA, whatever, uh, uh, life cycle fund 
right. parks and fun, and and it turns out horribly, and because we have another fifty three percent decline in the stock market right before a whole bunch of people retire. And there's seventy five million people right now in the risk zone. Yeah, and the market doesn't recover, and then the lawsuits begin, and George and Peters say, "Hey, this happened to me too, or my father." Uh, and fight got it. And Yale University has a deep pocket. It's got this endowment. So you're really, uh, I've learned through this conversation, yours V. Bodhi about, and me, to tell you the truth, we, our view is that the fiduciary only correct thing to do is to put people into tips and only tips and then let them take the risk if you're an employer. Yeah. That putting people into target, de defaulting them into something risky is not fiduciarily responsible. Here, here. Totally agree. And and again, I think the mindset on the part of fiduciaries is, especially the consultants, because the consultants are really choosing target date funds, is everybody's using T. Rowe, Fidelity, Vanguard. It's procedurally prudent. Now, 10 years ago, everybody was paying way too much. And actually not the plan sponsor, but they were allowing the participants to pay way too much. And it was, just, it was obvious where, you know, there's a share class that was substantially cheaper, but the plan sponsor got sold the expensive share class. And the participants, of course, you know, they, they took it. So there's precedent for suing on the basis of substantive prudence rather than procedural prudence. Right. TIA has been sued by many universities, is for, I think, I think this is true, ah. for overcharging or uh, for some of their... Okay. Yeah, funds. Interesting, yeah. Providing, so, I believe. So there's, there's their incentives modify behavior. There's carrots and sticks. The carrots don't change much at all. So nothing's going to change in target date funds until there's lawsuits, sticks. Let me, let me ask you one last question about... These folks who get to retirement and they have their four four one k money, their target date money sitting there, and now they're they've decided to retire. Uh, maybe it's from Northrop, whatever Boeing, and they're taking their money out. Uh, a lot of them are doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Do you have any advice on how that money should be? Would you? Okay, we did talk about. Uh, the the notion of not being too too nervous about the stock market as you're aging mm -hmm. to to be even be a little more aggressive with the stock market because of the balancing we talked about but do you know what people are actually doing you think they're just no nobody the does and that's that's that that is um, I don't know if we ever will know I mean you, you can certainly argue that maybe they should buy an annuity and and not try to take this get it done. Um, so my proposal would be that the, that the Treasury, you know, the Treasury is, is issuing inflation index bonds tips. Yeah, right. To first of all, make them should not be taxing the inflation component of the return to tips. Okay. So that people can have that risk out of their lives. They should eliminate that, but they should also have uh, contingent tips that are taxed appropriately where you only get paid off if you're alive. So in effect, by buying a sequence of tips, a uh, a ladder of tips, you buy in effect a real annuity, and now you have. Yes. Yeah. So the Treasury could do this overnight. If I were Treasury Secretary, I'd have this done before I got into the before I sat down in my seat. Yeah. Stay at my job. I would do these two things, and this would resolve the uh, the big dilemma that millions of 30, 40 million people are facing in old age, which is how to stay, stay safe with respect to their investments and in all. So you age. buy you buy a government ins insured annuity is sort of what you're something well, like that. You know, the government isn't responsible for making inflation largely. Right. So they can, they're the only ones that can really insure against inflation. Mm -hmm. They can only, you know, they're the ones that can control their behavior. And then by making it um, contingent on your surviving, you're really pulling the risk across your cohort. Of course, so these would be cohort-specific treasury okay. bonds. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to get on all, all the details, but sure. Bob Burton has 
I sent a proposal with a, another colleague called Selfies. Is similar, similar oh, similar. yeah. That's uh, John O'Brien, right? Yeah. Uh, no, there's a guy kind of uh, I know John O'Brien uh, uses that acronym. So maybe he's piggybacked on other people, but. Anyway. Yeah. No, no, uh, no, he's a brilliant guy. Just His name is just escaping me. But mm. um, so there are ways we can use finance to improve people's lives. Yeah, I think so. I mean, just as an example, I mean, we have just in the newspaper, it's the last thing I'll say, and then we'll, we'll, we'll say, say goodbye to everybody. But um, California, you can't buy from uh, State Farm homeowners insurance anymore. That the largest. I know. As a previous, <laughs> yeah. I just read this in the New York Times. Yeah, right. You can't buy because of fire uh, hazard. You can't buy any kind of homeowners insurance, of, even for theft or flooding or anything in California from State Farm. They just out of the market. Right. Well, it seems to me that we could have a a government run uh, uh, fire lottery that people could buy. People on the East Coast that aren't worried about uh, fires could buy, uh, could get paid off if there's no fires in this part of uh, the, uh, you know, Silicon, whatever this particular, a part of uh, California, this particular could be specific to a geographic area uh, like Napa Valley. And these people who buy the lottery that says, uh, I get paid off if there is a fire of this magnitude or bigger, they can protect themselves. And now yeah. we can have diversification across the country. Yeah, sure. Rather than having each state have its own insurance system in effect. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So other things can be done. You've uh, made lots of contributions to people to help people to the extent possible. And uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the public for. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the, I, I, this is totally off the target date fund topic. This um, raising the debt ceiling. It seems to me that what we've done is remove the ceiling. There is no ceiling anymore. Is that, is that an accurate statement? So, so my view is that if people go to, Sign up at uh, you know Larry Kotlick up dot substack sub, substack dot com. Uh-huh. If anybody's not signed up already, they'll they'll see a piece I did two days ago about uh, you know my views on views on a debt debt deal. Uh huh. Basically, the vast majority of the government's liabilities are off the books. Yeah, so I know that. Yeah, around right. with like kind of you know small potato thing. They basically did nothing. Minor changes, just like the 2017 tax reform. Yeah, it's just drama. It's 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 um. It's just yeah. And drama. It's charade. Like we did it. We actually came to Congress. We did something, and we both everybody won and reelect us. Whereas Social Security has a 65.9 trillion dollar unfunded liability reported March a month ago exactly by the Social Security trustees. Yeah. Okay. Two and a half times the official debt. It's it's grown by. $10 trillion since 2020 and nobody's paying any attention. It's that number is put in the very end of the book uh, of the trustees report, like page 250. Okay. So nobody should see it. And we have liabilities for, so we need to do long-term what we call fiscal gap accounting, generational accounting to understand how we're. I agree. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Because they do this in Australia in New Zealand in the, the EU has a fiscal sustainability report, and they're doing this routinely, mm -hmm. looking at everything, put everything on the books. Good. We are completely bankrupt as a nation doing what we're doing. We can fix things intelligently and not take a huge amount of fiscal pain, but by the way we're doing it, we're just going, going to ruin our kids' futures. This is Argentina. Uh, and Venezuela, and yeah, at the... Um... It's a, it's well, that, that, that answers my question. It doesn't yeah. matter what the debt ceiling is because we got bigger problems. Bigger fry, fish to fry. Yeah. Thanks okay. so much. Yeah, uh, thanks, Larry. This is fun. This was fun. great. We'll post this in a couple of days. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, you take care. Yeah, you too. Have a great weekend.